The end of 2023 is almost here, so it's time for me to cram in as many movies as possible. This is everything I watched in November. The Conference is a Swedish slasher movie that's got a fun, quirky vibe and some decent kills, but overall it didn't really land for me. This thing takes a while to get into the kills and really leans into taking the time to setting up its ensemble, which consists of a team of public sector employees on a work retreat, and there are some likable characters and actors in this group. It's filled with types you wouldn't normally see in a slasher movie, and that's the main appeal of this movie for me. Unfortunately, the lead character is a typical final girl archetype, with one of the laziest and most tacked on traumatic backstories I've seen since this trope became a trend. It's literally so haphazardly done that the movie itself seems to lose interest in it. I think much like an actual work retreat, your enjoyment of it will depend pretty heavily on how much you enjoy the people on it. And then I watched Sofia Coppola's Priscilla, which is a blistering takedown of the public legend that is Elvis Presley. I think Coppola walks a pretty tricky tightrope here, showing the very real flaws of Elvis, but not making him into a total monstrous caricature. The film has a very narrow focus, centering everything that happens through the eyes of the titular Priscilla, charting the couple's relationship from their first meeting when Priscilla was just a high schooler, through the inevitable dissolution of their marriage. It's a death by a thousand cuts, inflicted by a superstar who could do no wrong publicly, against an isolated girl surrounded only by her abuser's yes-men. Kaylee Spaney is a revelation as Priscilla, and Coppola's eye for small moments of specificity remains one of her strongest assets. I do wish we had seen a little more build-up for the film's climax, which kind of comes out of nowhere, but that final scene itself, set to an incredible needle drop, is still really great. I was a big fan of this one. Then I watched Jawan. To be completely honest with you, prior to RRR, my experience with Indian cinema was derived almost exclusively from compilations on YouTube. Seeing RRR first is a bit unfair to everything else because I think it's a bit transcendent, but I'm glad it's opened my eyes to other films from India, be they Bollywood, Tollywood, Kaliwood, or anything else. With that said, I think Jawan is a lot of fun. It's maximalist filmmaking to the highest order. It's really an Indian Fast and Furious, with insane action, over-the-top CGI, baffling plot twist, but all held together with a big, dumb, bald-headed heart, and an emphasis on hashtag family. Shah Rukh Khan is a freaking superstar, and I'm sure that's an incredibly obvious statement to everyone that's followed his career for years, but as someone who's only just now discovering him this year with both Jawan and Patan, I've become an instant fan, and I'm looking forward to diving in to discover older gems from his filmography. And then I watched Nyad, the first narrative feature from acclaimed documentarians Jimmy Chin and Elizabeth Chai Vassarelli, Nyad tells the debatably true story of an aging athlete who attempts the seemingly impossible swim from Cuba to Florida. This movie did not work for me at all. I've really loved Chin and Vassarelli's previous documentaries like Free Solo and The Rescue, where I think they've proved themselves to be masters at crafting truly exhilarating sequences dedicated to impressively masterful feats of the human body. On paper, Nyad should be another slam dunk for them, but I think they proved themselves to be completely out of their depth when it comes to narrative filmmaking. The script is straight out of generic biopic 101, the directing choices are distractingly baffling, even Annette Benning, an incredible actress, is completely miscast or miscalculated as the titular Diana Nyad. Only Jodie Foster comes out of this one unscathed. She's genuinely great in this, and it's great to have her back on screen. And then I watched When Evil Lurks, and I don't remember the last time a film made me this angry. The first act of this thing is genuinely incredible. There's excellent ideas in world building, with demonic possessions and exorcisms being commonplace. An interesting set of rules, escalating tension, and an absolutely brutal mean streak as the evil at the film center spreads and begins taking its first victims. Act 1 is modern horror classic material, and then it just goes completely off the rails. Unnecessary exposition dumps for plot points they had already expertly seeded in naturally. The main characters start behaving in irrational and absurd ways for the sole purpose of advancing the plot. And then they introduced a major plot element involving the main character's autistic son that I found to be bordering on offensive. So yeah, not a fan of this one. And then I watched The Marvels. I really wanted to like this one, but it was a big miss for me. There's some legitimately fun and interesting ideas in here that either aren't explored properly or are edited to shreds. 
the villain is completely underwritten, the Skrull Kree plot feels like such a wasted afterthought, and after several MCU appearances, including a prior solo movie, they still have no idea what to do with the characterization of Captain Marvel, leaving the talented Brie Larson completely adrift on how to play her. There's a scene with the cats that I thought was genuinely great, Miss Marvel's family is a lot of fun, and Amon Vellani as Miss Marvel easily steals the movie. You could easily throw out everything else here, but please protect her at all costs. By contrast, I was pretty stunned by Loki Season 2. The Marvels and almost every other Marvel property have been plagued by the same boring style and visual palette for over 20 movies now, so it kind of blows my mind when I see an MCU property that's got its own unique look and feel. The visuals of Loki aren't just technically better than most MCU properties of late, they're actually unique and creatively interesting. The storytelling feels surprisingly disconnected from the larger MCU tapestry, allowing them to make big and bold decisions without having to worry about how this piece fits in with all of their other projects. The finale does something that very few MCU properties are allowed to do, which has come to a definitive and satisfying conclusion. The visuals, the performances, the score all come together to make Loki feel epic, which unfortunately for a series about superheroes is not a word I use very often. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to put Loki amidst all of the all-time television greats, but in the midst of a pretty bleak MCU slump, I've gotta bow down to the god of mischief. And then I watched Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me. I'm watching Twin Peaks for the first time and I just got to the film Fire Walk With Me. This is a weird movie to judge on its own as it feels like there's side plots setting up future installments that either never came or came 25 years later. But the main thrust of the story, centering on the final moments of high schooler Laura Palmer's life, are pretty incredible. It's much darker and more emotional than the original series and Cheryl Lee is given a spotlight in the lead role that she never really had before, and she absolutely crushes it. She's incredible here in a role that's an extremely complex enigma. This movie is weird, it's heartbreaking, it's gorgeous, and it may be the best piece of the entire Twin Peaks mythology. And then I watched Alexander Payne's The Holdovers, which is one of my favorites of the year. It's a 70s throwback about a trio of lonely characters coming together to form their own makeshift family over a boarding school's holiday break. The script is super sharp and witty, and I kind of think it's one of the funniest movies of the year. It's definitely the most charming. All three leads in this are great. Paul Giamatti is the perfect curmudgeon with the secretly soft heart. Divine Joy Randolph walks the perfect line of hilarious and heartbreaking. And newcomer Dominic Sessa is a true revelation. His performance reminded me a lot of one of my all-time favorites, Jason Schwartzman in Wes Anderson's Rushmore. Both roles are incredibly tricky tightropes of pretentious and obnoxious teenagers that the audience needs to sympathize with and root for. Sessa knocked it out of the park, and I'm hopeful he'll find similar future success to Schwartzman. I think this is a new Christmas classic in the making, and it's certainly making my yearly rotation. And then I watched The Hunger Games, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. You know, in the lead up to this movie, I finally realized how underappreciated the original Hunger Games movies were for me. YA adaptations that were actually crafted with care, that didn't shy away from tackling pretty serious issues and dark themes of social inequality and classism. And this new installment, a prequel charting the rise of the villainous future President Snow, is no different. This is a YA adaptation made for mainstream audiences and teenagers that sensitively and thoroughly charts the fall and rise of a fascist dictator. Unfortunately, the actual Hunger Games portion of this movie were the least interesting parts for me in this Hunger Games movie. But when the focus is on Corio and his desperate bid for power, even at the cost of his apparent love, the movie really sings. And then I watch The Killer. David Fincher's latest slow burn thriller follows a hitman who is forced to go on the run and take out various enemies and associates after a hit gone wrong. It's hard to watch this movie and not feel like it's David Fincher's own meditation on creating art and his own career. This is a movie about the process, the patience, the tedium, the passion. And yet the movie also has a sense of humor, as the titular killer drones on with pretentious monologues and self-imposed rules that he constantly contradicts and undermines. It's Fincher simultaneously glorifying his infamous perfectionism and lampooning it better than any critic ever could. This isn't really what I was expecting from a David Fincher hitman movie, but it's really ingrained itself in me since watching, and I just admire it more and more the more I think about it. 
And then I saw Thanksgiving, another slasher movie, this one about a killer who is seeking revenge for a bloody Black Friday massacre. I think writer and director Eli Roth does a pretty good job at getting the tone and pacing right on this one. It's fast, there's constant kills, several of them really fun and brutal, and it never takes itself too seriously. Is this going to be a new seminal seasonal classic along the lines of Halloween? No, but despite being comprised of mostly empty calories, I had fun with it, so it's not a total turkey. And then I watched Next Goal Wins. It's hard to believe that in the span of like a year and a half, the movie going public seems to have turned on and gone completely antagonistic toward Taika Waititi. I'm a massive fan of pretty much everything he directed up until Thor Love and Thunder, and that first cinematic strike seems to have instantly struck him out in the court of public opinion. I was really hoping that Next Goal Wins would be a return to form, but I left pretty disappointed. Next Goal Wins tells the story of the American Samoa football team, the worst professional team in the world who have never scored a single goal in their entire history as a team. These lovable underdogs bring in a cranky jaded elite coach to whip them into shape, but wouldn't you know it, he's the one that learns a thing or two along the way. This movie was so strange for me because I can see the classic Taika just bubbling right under the surface but it just never fully gels. The entire American Samoa cast is an absolute delight, and the film coasts pretty effectively on their charms. But I think the problem lies in its lead character and performance by Michael Fassbender, an undeniably great talent who can't help but to come off as a bit of a tryhard desperate for laughs. So yeah, it's a 2023 Taika Waititi movie. And then I saw Saltburn, aka the not quite as talented but still kind of fun Mr. Ripley. I was a massive fan of Emerald Fennel's debut feature Promising Young Woman and I was really looking forward to this. And ultimately I think my biggest compliment is that it's super watchable. It's gorgeously shot, the performances are fun, there are moments where the satire really hits. I had a good time watching it, I was entertained. But on a script level, this thing completely falls apart. Many of the provocative scenes feel inserted in just for attempted shock value. The movie's themes on wealth and class get really muddled thanks to some inconsistent character choices, and I think the ending is a complete disaster. I'm struggling to remember the last time a mainstream movie had a twist ending that failed this hard. Crossing my fingers that Fennel's third outing is more of a return to form. And then I watched Mike Birbiglia's The Old Man and the Pool. I genuinely think Mike Birbiglia is one of our generation's greatest mainstream monologuist and writers. And his new special is no different. It's a charming and contemplative look into not only Mike's life, but his own mortality. I was personally moved by the hopeful notion of working past our own anxieties, ailments, and neuroses to work on actually bettering ourselves. Not just for us, but for the people in our lives that love and depend on us. And because Mike Birbiglia is a talented comedian, it's also really funny. It's on Netflix now, check it out when you have the chance. And then I watched Master Gardener. Paul Schrader's newest film is a slow burn meditative drama that uses the art of gardening to explore the beauty of rebirth, renewal, and growth of the human spirit. With patience we can adjust our surroundings, the way we care for ourselves, the very soil from which we originate to adapt into something new something better. It's also a pulpy crime thriller about white supremacy that uses those gardening themes as a delivery device for a pretty clunky story that doesn't quite come together in its mixture of tones and ideas. That said, it's still got some great ideas and Joel Edgerton is in top form in the lead role. With some proper pruning, this one really could have been something great. And then I finished the month off with Please Don't Destroy The Treasure of Foggy Mountain. The first feature film from the titular comedy trio tells the story of a group of friends who go on a zany adventure to find a buried treasure. It's fine, it feels like an overlong SNL sketch stretched way too thin, but the Please Don't Destroy guys have been the most consistently funny thing about SNL for the past few years, so that statement isn't quite as damning as it could be. I laughed several times, I checked my phone several times, I've already forgotten everything that I saw. And that's everything that I watched in November. Follow me on Letterboxd or other social media platforms at Josh D. Floyd if you want a real-time look at my thoughts on everything I see. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.